what comes right after their cliched remark tells you all you need to know. This is a kind of architectural logic of the novel that is new. No one before Flaubert had ever quite written like this. It seems to me it opens the gate to a larger type of fictional project. It opens some questions, too. I read it intentionally in a kind of cliched way. And so the most obvious reaction is that this, this just points out how degraded their romance is. But, you know, you could read it the other way. You could even see something all the more poignant that love has to battle against manure in some sense. That love has to make its way in a world that is filled up with the kind of animal husbandry issues that you see in this sequence. Once you think about this weave, it has a number of possible interpretations. It would seem that Madame Bovary is a very harsh and punitive novel. But the miracle of the book, at least in my opinion, is that it can be immensely moving. That Flaubert doesn't seem to be able to prevent himself from endowing Emma with a kind of beauty and a kind of pathos. We have sequences where we see Emma listening to Rodolphe after they've made love, sensing and smelling and sniffing the pomade on his hair, remembering the Vaubissard ball where she became dizzy through dancing. And we don't laugh at that. That's not a cliché. Her physical appearance, her presence, is wonderfully evoked. It's palpable in the novel. We have Charles looking at Emma, and he sees small drops of perspiration on her shoulders. We have Emma sewing and then sucking on her fingers as she uses a thimble. We have her finishing up a tiny little glass of liqueur, and we see her tongue go into the glass. We have Emma in full-blown sexual heat, and we have a description of her half-closed eyelids that are shaped for languid glances, breathing her dilating fine nostrils, the fleshy corners of her mouth. And we realize that Flaubert is attending to this woman's physical presence with a kind of almost holy attention. This, too, we don't laugh at. This endows this book with a kind of strange warmth on the far side of its architectural mockeries. At times of great feeling, Emma experiences a kind of undoing, as I think Flaubert did, where he just sort of comes apart. A kind of physical and perceptual collapse. As life treats her through these increasingly severe uh, uh, experiences, she realizes that her ambitions, her desires, are not going to be met. She gets a letter from her father, and she realizes how life was so much simpler before she was married, how much she had hoped for, and how little she's gotten, how many illusions she has had. She had lost them, I quote, one by one, at every stage in the growth of her soul, in the succession of her conditions, maidenhood, marriage, and love, and then this utterly, again, to me, breathtaking comparison, shedding them along her path like a traveler, leaves something of his wealth at every inn along his road. So there is an eloquence in this book on the far side of irony. That's a view of life as progressive despoiling, life as loss of illusions, life as a way in which wisdom is just a form of impoverishment or impoverishment is a form of wisdom. You lose, you lose, but you realize that you're losing. You take stock of it. This is what the depth of character, I think, is all about. And this, too, cuts deep. It cuts beyond any kind of irony about Emma. And in one of the lovely passages, when Emma is thinking of suicide, wanting to finally commit the last act, having gone to Rodolphe to try to borrow money from him. He's wealthy. She's convinced that he's got all the money that she needs. In fact, it turns out he doesn't really have it, and if he'd had it, he might have given it to her. She doesn't believe that. And she's almost in a kind of crazed condition as she's coming back home. She doesn't know what she's going to do. And 
she gets home and he writes that she is sort of lost, dazed, only, I quote, conscious of herself through the beating of her arteries and the arteries and the noise of her blood is compared to a kind of deafening music and it fills even the fields that she's walking on and then the camera of the text moves to those fields themselves and that the earth is described like the sea but even more yielding and that the furrows that are on the land are described like huge waves that are breaking into foam and then memories and ideas just crowd into her head and then he writes they explode at once like a thousand pieces of fireworks and she then sees and this is what Proust is going to do all of this much more deeply she sees all the scenes of her past her father Monsieur Leroy the guy who sold her all of the goods that she bought and that madness is coming on to her. She doesn't even remember exactly why she's so miserable. It's like she's being quasi erased. And from that, he describes her as suffering like wounded men feel as their life leaves them. And even that doesn't prevent him from describing the landscape. Night was falling, crows were flying about. And she looks and she feels that there were fiery spheres exploding in the air like bullets, whirling, whirling to melt at last upon the snow between the branches of trees. This kind of detailed description of her psychic condition at this moment, at the very onset of suicide, tells you something, again, about the care and I think the concern of Flaubert, perhaps even the love of Flaubert, Perhaps the identification of Flaubert with this character who was going under, and she's going to go under. She then goes to the pharmacist. She steals the poison. She eats it greedily. Eating something greedily becomes almost a kind of paradigm of her life. It's the figure that describes everything. That's what she's had, a great sustaining hunger throughout her life. And that is most beautifully encapsulated in the passage after her death, or as she's dying, when the priest comes to her to give her the last rites and the priest rises to take the crucifix then she stretched forward her neck like one suffering from thirst and gluing her lips to the body of the man god she pressed upon it with all her expiring strength the fullest kiss of love that she had ever given and he begins to recite the ceremony and he dips his thumb in the oil and he begins to give the extreme unction. First upon the eyes that had so coveted all worldly goods. Then upon the nostrils that had been so greedy of the warm breeze and the sense of love. Then upon the mouth that had spoken lies, moaned in pride and cried in lust. Then upon the hands that had taken delight in the texture of sensuality. And finally, upon the soles of the feet so swift when she had hastened to satisfy her desires and that would walk no more. I think it's a heartbreaking passage that at death we see exactly the same hunger and desire now transferred to the last rites of a life that never managed to satisfy these things. There is compassion in this book. There's tenderness in this book. This is in a lecture where I'm telling you what a cold, surgical, brilliant writer this man is. There's heart in this book as well. The book leaves us not just with a bitter flavor, but a sense of a tragic aftermath that Charles, after she is dead, realizes how much she has deceived him. He's lost all his money. He's impoverished because of her debts. And this means that their daughter, Berthe, is going to be headed for a life of poverty, and exploitation so that the book I think ultimately does not really do away with the feeling that human sentiment and human desire have something intrinsically noble about them. Emma is of course deluded. Emma cannot find gratification but the search for beauty and the belief 